Our reading is from Genesis chapter 2, starting at verse 4. This is the account of the heavens and the earth when they were created, when the Lord God made the earth and the heavens. Now, no shrub had yet appeared on the earth, and no plant had yet sprung up. For the Lord God had not sent rain on the earth, and there was no one to work the ground. But streams came up from the earth and watered the whole surface of the ground. Then the Lord God formed a man from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And the man became a living being. Now the Lord God had planted a garden in the east, in Eden, and there he put the man he had formed. The Lord God made all kinds of trees grow out of the ground, trees that were pleasing to the eye and good for food. In the middle of the garden were the tree of life and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. A river watering the garden flowed from Eden. Eden. From there, it was separated into four headwaters. The name of the first is the Pishon. It winds through the entire land of Halish, where there is gold. The gold of that land is good. Aromatic resin and onyx are also there. The name of the second river is the Gihon. It winds through the entire land of Cush. The name of the third river is the Tigris. It runs along the east side of Ashur. And the fourth river is the Euphrates. The Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and take care of it. And the Lord God commanded the man, you are free to eat from any tree in the garden, but you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. For when you eat from it, you will certainly die. The Lord God said, It is not good for the man to be alone. I will make a helper suitable for him. Now the Lord God had formed out of the ground all the wild animals and all the birds in the sky. He brought them to the man to see what he would name them. And whatever the man called each living creature, that was the name. So the man gave names to all the livestock, the birds in the sky, and all the wild animals. But for Adam, no suitable helper was found. So the Lord God caused the man to fall into a deep sleep. And while he was sleeping, he took one of the man's ribs and then closed up the place with flesh. Then the Lord God made a woman from the rib he had taken out of the man, and he brought her to the man. The man said, This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, for she was taken out of man. That is why a man leaves his father and mother and is united to his wife, and they become one flesh. Adam and Eve were both naked, and they felt no shame. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thanks, Sheila. And as Sarah comes up to speak to us this morning, let's pray for her. Father, I thank you for Sarah. Thank you for who she is. Thank you for her family and all that they bring and how they serve and give themselves to building your kingdom here in Brentford. 
Pray that, um, that as she speaks to us today, that you will anoint her, you would fill her with your Holy Spirit, you would bring encouragement, um, and you would speak through her to us, that we would hear what you would say to us, and we would receive your blessing, your encouragement, and your words of life. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Sarah. If you, you've watched, um, if you've not watched last week's sermon, you might want to do that just uh, t- because this week uh, builds on last week's uh, talk. I've got some stacking blocks here. These are the best I could find at the last minute yesterday. Uh, and I kind of want to use them to illustrate what I want to sort of say today. So let me put those up for you. They illustrate to me the foundations that are put in place in Genesis, and they're sequential. You have to to build on each box in order to create something. And in the same way, there's an order and a layering to creation. And so last week, we learned in Genesis 1 that, that God is good, that the world is good, and that humankind is good. And we talked about who we are in relation to God and what that uh, relationship is like. And Genesis 2 builds on that foundation and it takes it up a level because it talks about how we relate to each other. You see, we relate to each other best when we know that God is good and the world is good and humankind is good. And our relationships have the best possible start when our foundations are strong. God isn't just interested in how we relate to him. He's interested in how we relate to each other as well. He didn't create the world, sort of press the button and then step back. He's very concerned about culture and environment and making sure that things are in place to ensure that human beings flourish. If I wanted to um, grow a plant, I can't put seeds, compost, a pot and some water into a sunny room and expect them to pot themselves and grow. I have to put the seed and the soil together in the pot and water it and put it into sunlight. So I have to set the conditions to grow the plant. And in the same way, God's involvement in creation is gone going. He wanted to put the conditions in place to make sure uh, that he created a world that would thrive. So let's turn our attention to chapter two, which is this final stacking cup here, uh, builds on all the previous foundations laid in Genesis 1. In verse 5, we read that there were no plants at this point, no grain, nothing was growing, and God hadn't sent any rain. And then he creates dust from the earth and water, he creates man from dust and water comes up through the earth and God plants a garden with two trees, the tree of life and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And he appoints man to tend and care for it, but not to eat the truth, not to eat the fruit from the tree of knowledge of good and evil. And so boundaries are put in place, which are an important part to human flourishing. Our bodies limit us. We, there are cycles of days and seasons, but there are also things that are off limit to us if we want to live under God's blessing. And that's interesting because if we remember from last week, this was written whilst the Jews were in exile in Babylon. And they were in exile in Babylon because they had chosen not to live under God's blessing and had been disobedient. They'd worshipped other gods and had chosen their own wisdom and their own way. And their disobedience had led them to stepping outside of God's blessing. And it had meant that they had embraced this curse of exile. They'd chosen to be God's rival rather than his friend. Their decided independence uh, from God was better than dependence on God. And so from verse 18, God places man in the garden to tend and care for it. And he begins to name all the animals, but no companion was found. And so God makes man a companion or a helper. So you can see how this is is kind of layering up and building up. Having laid the foundations of creation, time zones, day and night domains, agriculture, God now turns his attention to how this is going to work. And the primary driver here in this passage is relationship, which is the basic need for companionship and community and belonging. 
I lived in um, Nepal for a year, a long time ago now, and when I stepped out of my house into my garden, I had this panoramic view of the Himalayas, and I'm not talking like a glimpse through the trees, like in a small part of my garden. I literally had a 180 degree view of the, of the Himalayas right in my garden. And understandably, guests were always really bowled over by this, but all of those who lived there, all of us would say to each other, you can't live on a view. Um, despite the incredible scenery, it was lonely and it was isolating. And one of our primary physical needs, really, is, is relationship and human contact, which has obviously been highlighted in the last year during lockdown. And so the broad landscape of Genesis 2 is the nature of our relationships with one another, whether we are partnered up or not. So having created the world, God lays I think, some further foundations for what leads to human flourishing in terms of our relationships. Equality, vulnerability, and community. And I just want to take a look at each of these in turn. Now, starting with equality, there's something specific I want to teach in today's sermon. I personally find it fascinating and life-changing, but I'm not sure. You may too, I don't know. But for me, this falls into the category of, of things that all Christians should know. And if you've been around Christian circles long enough, you'll know that equality between men and women hasn't always been a given. So for obvious reasons, um, this is something that I feel quite strongly about. Okay, so essentially, in Genesis 2, you'll notice that um, a man, or the man, is referred to Uh, for most of the first part of this chapter. And in Hebrew, this is ha-adam, and it's literally the Adam. The word for human is ha-adam, and this is neither male nor female. Ha-adam is an androgynous, genderless being at this point. Ha is the, Adam is the ground, the being made from the ground. So from verses 1 to 20, and I've got it in proof on the screen for you in Hebrew. (laughs) So um, from verses 1 to 20, this androgynous human being, Ha-Adam, is mentioned all the way through. In verse 18, God says, it's not good for man to be alone. I'm going to create a suitable helper for him. So he puts Ha-Adam into a deep sleep and he took part of its side, he closed up the hole and he made a woman. And from here on in, The man is referred to as Ish, and the woman is referred to as Ish Shah. God created men and women simultaneously. He created an androgynous human being, Ha Adam, but they did not become male and female until Ha Adam goes to sleep and has a chunk taken away. Did you know this? Is it exciting? I think so. Um, So we start with Ha Adam, and we end up with man, Ish, and a woman, Ish Shah both of which come from Ha-Adam. So we've seen the text on the screen. To me, this says that men and women were created together, and the fact that woman was created from the man's side, or Ha-Adam's side, is important too. Not from his head to top him, not from his feet to be trampled upon, but his side to be equal with him. And God didn't make Eve from different dust. They were both made from the same substance, not a separate creation, Um, but a separate expression of the same creation. So no one sex here is superior or top dog. There is no headship, no master, no domination, no control. That comes in Genesis 3 when relationships go completely awry, and we'll come to that next week. There is also no place here for male supremacy or the kind of feminism that says that men aren't needed. There is no hint here of male or female dominance or male or female subordination. The original design for relationships was based on equality and mutual respect, and men and and women are equal eye to eye, shoulder to shoulder at this point in our story. Now, bearing in mind these are the first two humans, uh, you know, in the garden, they needed to learn to socialise And I find it quite ironic. The two developmental milestones that all toddlers have to learn are sharing your toys uh, and taking turns. And one of the things that humans need to learn early on is that we are not the only person here, that other people have the same rights as us, that no one is more important than another person. We can't practice equality in our relationships without understanding and making space for others. 
And our biggest challenge really is to learn to treat others equally as, uh, as, as well as we treat ourselves. And so perhaps it's worth pausing here and just checking in and asking the question, well, how are our relationships doing in terms of equalness or equality? The opposite of this is power and control. But does one person's need, needs dominate in your friendships or your relationships or your family life? Are our expectations of the people who we live with or the people who we interact with, are they realistic? Have the other, have, has the other person agreed to them? Is decision-making equal? Is there compromise? Can we find solutions that are acceptable to both people? And I think it's worth acknowledging here that this is really hard, that God-honoring relationships uh, takes quite a lot of work. And carving out a quality and constantly navigating that in a relationship is something that we, we ongoingly have to do. It's not as though we do it at the beginning. Uh, we have to continue to attend to this. I was asked this week whether I preached to myself or to other people, and my answer was to both, because the very stuff I preach on, I'm usually struggling with at the same time. So we're in this together trying to work this out. Part of that climb back to uh, the way things were designed to be, back to that, that journey in Genesis 1 that I talked about last week, is striving for equality. It's working, actually, for equality in our relationships. And the acknowledgement that other people's uh, needs are important is the basis of most of uh, loads of Jesus' teaching about loving our, our neighbours and serving other people and putting the needs of others ahead of our own. This comes from Genesis 2, which was the very foundation laid by God of this is what works for life. Do this and, you know, you'll experience God's blessing in life. This is how it's supposed to operate. And it's also one of our strap lines as a church. Everyone matters. Not one person's needs and wants at the expense of everybody else's. That's not equality. But what's good for the whole group held in tension with those individual wants. The stress being that everybody matters. So that's the first thing, equality. The second is vulnerability, because there's this grenade thrown in the last line of this chapter. It says, although they were both naked, neither of them felt any shame. Well, why would you even say that unless you knew what was coming up in Genesis 3? If you haven't heard of, of Brené Brown, you should watch some of her stuff on, on YouTube. She's a researcher and a researcher into to shame. Um, that, and concluded really that it was the most debilitating disease in the whole of the human race because shame makes us uh, blame others, evade responsibility and hide. It causes us to retreat from God and to retreat from each other. And it accumulates in childhood. It says, I'm bad, I'm stupid, everything I touch goes wrong. I ruin everything. It's tied to our past and it's like heavy baggage that we bring with us wherever we go. It prompts us to ruminate over stuff that's happened and it builds up barriers. Jesus account, encountered shame in Zacchaeus, in the woman accused uh, at court in adultery, the woman at the well. Shame is, is, is everywhere. And this high correlation of, of shame uh, and addiction, depression, violence, aggression, bullying, suicide, eating disorders and busyness, that's what shame leads to. But the antidote to shame is vulnerability, which is allowing yourself to be seen with all your imperfections and the ability to let go of who you think you ought to be and embrace who you are. It's not comfortable. It takes work. It, it, it means saying, I love you first. It's doing something when there are no guarantees. It's the courage to say when someone asks you how you are, actually, I'm not doing too well. I'm really struggling at the moment. It's, it's allowing ourselves to be seen and known by others. Before Adam and Eve ate the fruit, the forbidden fruit, they had no shame. They were naked. They were exposed emotionally and physically, and, and it wasn't a problem until they chose their own path in Genesis 3. And instead of admitting their mistake and taking responsibility, they descend into shame, realize they're naked, hide and cover up. And we do the same thing in our relationships at times. When we're exposed, we withdraw so that no one knows the real us. We keep people at a distance and hide like Adam and Eve. Or we avoid conflict by trying to keep everyone happy. Or we run from our shame by attacking others and shaming them 
instead. And we see this when Adam and Eve blame the serpent in chapter 3. Shame is devastating and it's crippling and it's not part of God's plan and purpose for us. But we can take steps to address our shame by being vulnerable with those closest to us and by choosing to allow others to see us with all our imperfections. And then thirdly, there's community. The main driver in this passage is to do with relationships and how we manage them, and it's the fourth block here on our foundation. It says later in Genesis 1, God blessed them and told them, multiply and fill the earth, subdue it and be masters over it. And in verse 15 of this chapter, God tells man to tend and care for the garden. And what comes out of the reference to the rivers is that there are four huge rivers, all of which flow out of the Garden of Eden to the rest of the earth. So God sets up creation not as an end of it in itself and a kind of wonderful utopia sort of system, but to flow out to others. And there's a sense in which, in this chapter, that this is just the beginning of the story. There's more for us to do. There's an ongoingness to creation where we are given the responsibility to carry on creating and growing. And this is also important in verse 18 when we talk about God creating the woman as helper. And much teaching has, you know, not helped in the area of equality around this subject. The Hebrew word for, for helper here is Eza Konegdo, and Eza is to protect, to, to surround, to defend, or to cherish. And Konegdo comes from the word neged, which means opposite or opposite against. So in other words, the role of helper is not in any way subordinate. Throughout the Old Testament, God is described in these words as a helper to his people. Helper in this context is equal opposite to the person that you are helping. It is about partnership in relationship, nose to nose, shoulder to shoulder, eyeball to eyeball, in order to collectively help each other do the work that God has called us to do. And this building block of relationship doesn't have to start with couples. It relates to communities who work to protect, to surround, to defend, to cherish those who, are in rela- who, those who we are in relationship with because together we are more than the sum of our parts. There's power in community. So if we come back to our stacking blocks, God here is laying the foundations um, for a healthy worldview for human well-being and human flourishing. The basics are all here to enable us to flourish and to thrive. And the way of blessing is to know and live within this mindset, know deep in our hearts as well, that, that God is good, that the world is good, that humankind is good, and that relationships are here to bless others, but also to, to bless each other and to bless others, to flow out from us to the wider community. The best way that these relationships function in order to flow out and to serve others and to build the wider community is when we treat each other equally, when we are vulnerable and share ourselves with each other, and when we work together on things that are bigger than just ourselves. God is in this passage, if you remember, is speaking to exiles Jews and exiles who, like Adam and Eve, just um, thought their way was best. And God brought those people out of exile in Babylon back to the land that he had for them. And in the same way, Jesus came to deliver us out of whatever exile we find ourselves in. Whether it's in damaged relationships or shame or isolation. However far we feel that we've drifted from this way of blessing, God can always reach us and save us and bring us home into this relationship with him and with others that brings life. Let's pray together. Lord Jesus, we thank you that that you're good, that you created a good world, 
that humankind is a fantastic and good creation and that when you look upon us, you think that we are lovely and beautiful and pleasing. Thank you that your goodness and your goodness towards us forms the very kind of DNA of creation. Thank you for the relationships that you have given to help us to flourish and grow. The relationships with each other, the relationships with you, the relationships with our wider community. Would you bless us and would you help us and our relationships to embody equality and vulnerability and a sense that we can work together. In Jesus' name, amen. I think we're going to stand together to sing.